help me welcome to the stage the candidates for Ward 3, Susie Hildago Faring and Reagan Sample. Welcome guys, welcome to the stage and welcome to Silver Creek High School. We're excited to have you here tonight. I'm going to uh, review the rules and the order of the debate so that everyone in the audience knows what's going on and that the candidates know as well, all right? So our timing will be strictly kept so that each candidate has the equal time. And I'll move to the next question, regardless of whether the candidate has uh, finished or not. So I will cut you off. It's my one chance to be rude. Uh, our timers tonight, a big round of applause for Kathy Crowder and Kathy Stevens. Thank you. That's right up front. For the audience, could you please be respectful of the other candidates and uh, turn off your phones, mute your cell phones, and refrain from audio, um, audible or visual disturbances, if you could. Uh, for our evening tonight, we'd like to move quickly and the cooperation and support of all of you is appreciated. One final note, the audience may applaud at the end of each segment, but please refrain from applauding or other audible demonstrations until the individual candidate has answered the question. This will uh, help uh, from the distractions and we can stay on time and take care of that. Does that sound good? Candidates, please pay attention to the lights in front of you on the stage. Uh, this is not Ken Pratt, so that we don't want you just blowing through those lights. We'd like you to pay attention uh, to those, all right? When the yellow light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Your answer must be complete when the red light comes on. Red, yeah, stop means stop. There we go. You have a minute and a half for an introductory statement. At the end of the segment, you'll have a minute for closing remarks. I'll ask you the questions. You'll have one minute to respond. Uh, we'll rotate the questions so each candidate gets to be first. Uh, the candidate answering the question first will also be given a 30 second uh, at the end of the other kind of a rebuttal. Uh, 30 seconds to clarify or make any other questions you would have that. I'll read the question uh, from audience. If we have some time, we'll be able to add some audience questions. And those same rules will apply. 30 second rebuttal from the audience questions, all right? We'll also have lightning round questions. And you'll get 10 seconds to answer those questions. I'll reiterate the timing right before we get going. You ready? Ready? You ready to hear everybody? Susie, would you, uh, you have the first opening statement, and then Reagan, you'll have the, the first um, closing statement. So here we go. Reagan, how about your opening statement? Oh, me? Yep. Oh, okay. So, hi, my name is Susie Valgo Faring. Um, I'm an educator with the St. Rain Valley Schools and vice president of the St. Rain Valley Education Association. Um, I felt in over the years, just the leadership roles that I've taken with the Teachers Association at the state and national level, I really felt um, I needed to bring my, my talents and leadership skills to home, bring it home. I feel like we're in a pivotal point in the growth of Longmont. It's grown greatly over the last uh, 10 years or over the years. Uh, and I just wanted to be a part of coming up with smart plans and working with council to come up with smart plans that really um, ensure the success and for all of our residents, not just a certain group of residents, but really the inclusivity for all, especially, especially taking keynotes to our rising, our number of babies that are coming in, making sure we have um, systems in place for preschool, early childhood education, um, daycare, a, um, a possibility, affordable housing, and also to meeting the needs of our um, disabled and our um, special needs individuals, our vulnerable population, our elderly. So it's really important that we have bring in that wide, wide aspect of different points of view and making sure they have they're represented and have a seat at the table. Thank you very much, Susie. Reagan, we'd like to hear your opening statements. You bet. So I'm Reagan Sample, and I'm running for City Council for Ward Three. I'm a Boulder County native. My wife and I have been in Longmont for 15 years, raising our three young boys. I want to make sure Longmont remains a wonderful place to live, to start a business, to raise a family, to grow old. I, know, I want to know I've done everything I can to make sure that our children will be able to live and work in their hometown if they want to in the future. That's why I'm running for city council. When I, when I talk to people about the issues they find important, most of that has to do with our growth be it traffic, affordability, homelessness, feeling safe in their neighborhoods. And there are a lot of good ideas that we can use to, or take advantage of to deal with these issues, but one thing they have in common is they require funding. 
And that's why it's so important that we support our local and small businesses. They're our economic engine, they're the drivers of our sales tax, and they're the creator of our jobs for today and for the future. As a council member, I'm gonna focus on what we have in common. The need for clean water, for affordable utilities, for our trash being picked up, for snow removal on our streets, because winter is coming. I will focus on what we have in common on our infrastructure, and bringing people together, and, and not division, and spending time on things that aren't city issues. Our growth requires us to also build constructive relationships with our neighboring communities, because all our growth affects each other. We need to have vision for the future, work together on issues we have in common, and for a council member for Ward 3, I'll build those relationships and listen to the residents and bring their concerns to council. Thank you very much. An applause for their first opening statement. The first question is, uh, Reagan, you'll be first. Longmont voters will be asked this fall to extend the street tax indefinitely. Are you in favor or should the tax be allowed to sunset and renewed with later voter approval? You know, I would say on this issue, uh, when it comes to like having a tax that goes for forever or sunset or for a period of time, I would probably lean towards, and when it comes to our streets, uh, this is one that I would be in favor of having that one go uh, and become permanent versus having to renew it every time and the expense that goes with that or the risk of it not taking place. Our transportation and education are vital to be funded. Thank you. Susie? So, um, so I too agree. Um, I, I didn't, so I've been one that I've walked for our mill levy overrides. So every time we need to acquire the right in, in line with what Tabor has asked of us, when we are trying to acquire the necessary funds to, so we can have the resources we need for our students, we have to go out and ask the voters for a mill levy override. Um, with this, this is an issue that is addressing our infrastructure, and we do, we do need to have this, um, this tax increase in place, and I would, I would support having it um, be a permanent. Indefinite. Reagan, you have a chance for anything to say? No? Okay. We're on to question number two. Recently, a pause on all development was proposed during which time a triple bottom line approach could be implemented in a desire to establish higher code requirements for sustainability. Would you have supported this if you were on council? And this question is for you, Susie, first. So um, I've been looking into the sustainability evaluation systems tool, and I believe it is a very um, powerful tool. I would like to see this implemented and in place and support um, the usage of the SES tool. I probably would have supported it. When we talk about smart growth and being strategic in how we plan and develop our communities, we need to have an infrastructure in place that addresses um, environment, e um, economic vitality, and culture and social um, inclusivity that um, address each, each part. Something else that I would like to see further is having different criteria dependent on where the development is taking place within the city, because not all are the same. All right. Reagan, do you need the question again, or are you good to go? I'm all good, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so as far as a moratorium, uh, I, would have, I would have said that I would, vote, I would have voted no for it. Uh, as far as any kind of plan for sustainability or future growth, if it's the SES or whatever that might be, once those are established, I think you need to uh, see how they work, be able to tweak them or adjust them over time. As far as a moratorium, we can go back to when we've had different periods of time where we stopped growth, or my old hometown of Boulder when they've stopped growth, and you see a lot of negative, uh, unintended consequence that comes with that. That's when Firestone, Frederick, Mead really started to boom because people didn't feel that they were welcome here. I think it sends a mixed signal to our business community. It's not something that's predictable that people can depend on. Different projects take a lot of upfront planning and upfront expense, and this is a signal that doesn't give them the surety that we're open for business. But once you have something in place like the SES or whatever that plan is to approve projects, it's important to see it through and tweak it as you need to. Susie, you have about 30 seconds of rebuttal if you'd like. Okay, that'll be fast. Um, so, so we do, we, we need to bring, make sure that we are having all necessary stakeholders uh, forward at the table. I do not believe that we should just be developing really quick. If we have something that we know would work and something that is in line with um, engage, engage Colorado or engage Longmont and what we plan and what we envision for our future, 
we need to make sure that uh, we are utilizing this rather than not really setting those, those plans in place and moving forward with development as is. All right, thank you very much. Lightning round question. These are 10 seconds, and these are uh, absolutely essential for every voter to be able to make a decision here. This is, this is the hard stuff. Okay. Are you ready? I mean, this is, this is where the rubber hits the road right here. All right. Uh, we're going to go with Reagan, you're first. From the Chamber promo video, did you see the Chamber promo video? Yeah. Smile, wait, there you did, good. All right, for the debate, you may have seen this question. Is the hot dog a sandwich? You have 10 seconds. It's only a sandwich if you have some sort of vegetable on it, sauerkraut or roasted peppers. All righty, okay, Susie. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, I know that's been on every voter's mind. It's just really weighing heavily on that. All right, question number three. Uh, Reagan, you're first, uh, or Susie, you're first on this one. Some economic forecast predicts a slowdown in coming months. With that in mind, what do you feel should be the city's priorities in preparation? Susie. So um, I, I would think we need to be careful with asking voters for tax increases. We need to be very um, mindful of future, um, being able to, to manage uh, how, how our working class folks can be able to, to pay for bills. We have an increase in our utilities that will be coming up, and a lot of people, folks that I've talked to about it are very concerned because they are on fixed incomes, or they're retired, or they have kids with special needs, and they don't have the resources to, to backfill. We are, a lot of us are living paycheck to paycheck, so we need to ensure that we are very careful what we ask of the voters as far as paying um, paying extra out. So, so careful planning, strategic. All right, right. You know, I would say when you're thinking of possibility of economic slowdown, you need to make sure, uh, old mentor of mine used to say, you gotta put hay in the barn. <clears throat> you gotta be, we need to be careful that we're not over leveraging ourselves till we get in a situation where we can't uh, cover what we need to cover. In times of good times, we need to make sure we're maintaining things like our wastewater treatment plant with estimates between $30 and $50 of maintenance needed for it. Uh, the time to take care of that is now while the coffers are, are full and we have things uh, taken care of uh, and we're able to afford it versus putting that off into the future and we might not be able to do it and have to do things that are more drastic that might be tax increase or, or taking on debt at a time where interest rates may be uh, not as favorable for now or our balance sheet as far as a city budget might not be able to uh, take those expenses. So, and speaking of city budget, so I serve on the negotiations team for the St. Rain Valley um, Education Association. So when, I, um, when we sit at the table, we're with the district. And we've analyzed over the years. So currently, our um, general fund budget is $448 million. And our overall budget is $780 million. So we look at those. Uh, several years, I've been working to um, analyze those pieces, and it's really looking at long-term consequences and knowing how to read the budget and what funds do we have readily available for certain for certain aspects. And so those would be something that I would really be cognizant of. All right. Another lightning round question. Uh, this one might have a little bit more bearing. What's, uh, and we're going to go with Reagan. What's your favorite Longmont event or festival? Gosh, um, it'd be a toss-up between the old festival on Maine and Art Walk. So, um, so I come with Latino roots, so Cinco de Mayo Festival is always something near and dear to my heart, um, so that's... Very good, and uh, join us for uh, Chinese New Year in February over here, we host that, that's a lot of fun. All right, uh, Susie, this one is your first on this one. What can City Council or should City Council do to make Longmont more attractive for expanding or, and or relo relocating business? So it, it is, again, strategic planning, L working with appropriate stakeholders, the chamber, the Latino chamber, um, people who live, the residents who are in those surrounding areas, um, promote and increase the infrastructure in those areas, looking at walkability. So people can park a little further away, walk, walk to their destinations, or even from their homes. So it's for city, it's really making sure those infrastructure systems are in place that would attract and keep people kind of walking up and down Main Street in a safe manner. So. Thank you. Megan? Well, I think one of the biggest things is being very strategic with a clear vision of what we want to have happen in different economic nodes in the city. 
targeting diversified industries as industry and economic times ebb and flow to make sure that uh, when one area is pulling back or slowing down that we're not hit as a whole city. Uh, developing our North Main Corridor, our South Main Corridor, looking out east and what we can put out there and being very strategic at what we bring in and also creating a competitive environment for those employers. Uh, we've already seen in talking with Lama Economic Development Partnership, the uh, pay that people are getting over at Smuckers, for example, has drawn employees from other businesses and has forced them to increase either benefits they offer or pay that they're, that they're bringing in. So I'd say targeting diversified industries, a clear vision of what we want in our different economic nodes would be the way to bring people. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So uh, yes, it is. It's that collaboration with uh, um, the necessary stakeholders. Uh, I've been reading the design for uh, the plan for the um, main corridor and looking and knowing that those ideas were brought in by community. So ensuring that we support and value those and constant collaboration with our um, Longmont Downtown District Authority, with the Chamber, uh, the experts in the field who really can help guide and inform our decisions. Very nice, thank you very much. Uh, that is uh, the end of our questions, but I would like to let you have your closing statements now. Uh, Reagan, we're gonna let you start with your closing statements. <clears throat> so there are challenges a growing city like ours has, and it might sound kind of silly, but I think it's a good problem. It's a good problem when people want to move to and live in your city. I think we have a bright opportunity. We've got a lot of great energy in Longmont, but we have to make sure we do it right. We can't have a short-term view, and we have to plan for the future with vision. In a recent debate, one of the candidates referenced that city, about the city providing jobs, and that's not the job of the city. Instead, the city's job is to build and maintain infrastructure and create policies that foster an environment in which businesses can open, flourish, and create the jobs of the future, and grow our economy, and increase our prosperity. We, need to go, we, need, we are going to need someone on council with a proven track record of bringing people together, finding common ground and compromise. We'll need someone that builds relationships and partnerships, someone with experience in economics, business, and finance to oversee our budget. And based on my experience, knowledge, and passion for this town, I know I'm the right person to represent the citizens of Ward 3, and I respectfully ask for your vote. So it's coming in from a diverse background, and not just racially, um, culturally, but really just in different areas. I've, I'm a public school educator. I am the union vice president of our local association. I sit on the negotiations team. Additionally, I also serve with the uh, Latino outreach for the supporting action for mental health. Um, my daughter had attempted suicide and bringing that, um, that carrying that piece and really finding what sort of resources our families in crisis need. I know that because I've experienced that. So those would be the things that I would bring to the to to council. My life experience, my leadership capacity um, in looking and analyzing data and the numbers to come up with smart, sustainable plans. M my goals, my vision for Longmont is really focusing on inclusivity and equity for all, the quality of life, so that everyone can thrive, regardless of your race, regardless of income, um, and regardless of being um, of. Uh, of having challenges and sustainability. Thank you very much, Susie. <laughs> Thank you so much. So a big round of applause for our candidates, Susie and Reagan. Thank you so much. And thank you, for, thank you for running and caring about our city enough to do this. We're going to have a, a little short intermission as we prepare for our, uh, our at-large candidates that are coming up next. So we'll be right back. Alrighty, we are ready to go. And I want to do a quick announcement. There's an opportunity for you, for the audience, to ask some questions. Uh, there's a table outside the front door, right outside the auditorium. Uh, they have asked that uh, your questions be written legibly. So I don't know if maybe there's some teachers in the audience that they could go help decipher that for you. But please write legibly so that we can use your questions. Uh, ask your questions towards both candidates so that it can, can go for uh, both candidates or all of the candidates to ask. And, and again, that's just right outside the door and we'll try to get those up to me uh, so that we can share those with our candidates as well. So our next segment uh, is for at-large candidates. So if you would help me welcome Ron Gallegos, Matthew Garrett, Jeff Moore, and Joan Pegg to the stage. Okay. 
guys all comfortable up here, ready to go? All righty, I'm going to review the rules one more time just so that you have an opportunity to that. Please pay attention to the lights in front of you. Green light will be lit as, as soon as you begin speaking. When the yellow light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. And your answer must be complete when the red light comes on. And they just showed those for you, just in case. Each of you will have a minute for an introductory statement. At the end of the segment, you will have one minute for your closing remarks. I'll ask the questions. You'll have one minute to respond. We'll rotate the questions so that each candidate has an opportunity to answer a question first. The candidate answering the question first will also be given 30 seconds at the end uh, to respond if they would like to. We also uh, will have some clarifying opportunities as well. If time permits, I will uh, offer those questions from the audience and if the chamber folks can legibly read them for us. Uh, and again, those same rules apply with a 30 second rebuttal. Also, the lightning round with those very important questions, 15 seconds to answer those, and I will reiterate the timing. So opening statements, uh, we'll go with this. Matthew Garrett, would you please begin with your opening statement? Hi, I'm Matt Garrett. I um, decided a few months ago to run for city council because um, I was born and raised here. I've spent my whole life here, and uh, I felt like it was important to have somebody on city council that has lived here their whole life. Um, I grew up playing in the oligarchy, riding mini bikes and shooting BB guns at each other and throwing dirt clods, and we loved every minute of it. It was dangerous, and I'm lucky to be alive, but I am. I've also spent my whole, uh, my entire uh, professional career driving for UPS. I just got off work about 25 minutes ago and threw on my pants and drove straight over here. Uh, so this is why you get this. This is how I spent most of my time uh, going to my kids' events when they were in their... Uh, earlier years, but I'm here to uh, tell you I know I'm the right one for this, for this job. I know it. I absolutely know it. I know this city. I know everything about it, and I want a chance to um, uh, have a positive impact on the, on, on the city that I grew up in and I love. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joan, you're next. Thank you. I want to thank the, Ch the uh, Longmont Chamber for hosting this debate and thank all of you for attending. Um, when I ran for city council four years ago, it was to support our ban on fracking, promote smart development, bring rail to Longmont, create affordable housing, and make Longmont sustainable. But the peak service commuter rail is still my priority. The Northern Area Transportation Alliance, or NADA, was a little amazed at my passion when I became the liaison for the city. They thought Longmont didn't want rail because that's what the last liaison, Jeff Moore, told them. With that statement, he went against the 2004 vote, the economic development around a rail hub, and the democratic process. Because of my advocacy for the Northwest Corridor, BNSF is now doing a modeling on that line and have given us a cost estimate. NADA has asked me to be on their board as vice chair next year. Neither Ron, Matt, or Jeff have the network, diplomacy, or advocacy to move this project forward. We have more work to be done in all the areas I mentioned, however. The most pressing area is our commitment to 100% renewable energy by 2030. There's so much more that the city can do to move this objective forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Next up, Jeff Moore. Would you give us your opening statements, please? Hello, I'm Jeff Moore, and I want to thank you all for coming here tonight and hearing from your city council candidates. I served four years on council right after the 2013 flood, and I'm looking to return to council to serve the residents of Longmont. I bring prior council experience, knowledge, and a long-term vision so that all residents, no matter who they are, will know that I make decisions for the good of the entire community, not just for those that make the most noise. Decisions make, made on council affect your everyday lives more than most state and federal policies. I have the ability to understand complex issues and my proven ability to distill the facts into solutions is well recognized in my past council service. We don't need council members who refuse to listen to new ideas, who advance political agendas, and are not objective in decision making. We do need council members who want to explore new concepts, who focus on Longmont's issues, and who have an open mind. That's why it's so important to elect a council person that thinks clearly and innovatively. 
You may not always agree with my vote. However, I will always vote to keep Longmont moving forward. I, w I bring what we need, proven experience, a strong conviction to do the right thing with long-term sustainability and resiliency in mind. I will work to build Longmont's future. Thank you so much. And our final, uh, Ron. My name is Ron Gallegos. Uh, I previously had been on the council. Uh, I was on the board of directors of the National League of City, Cities, the Colorado Municipal League, the Hispanic locally elected officials. I bring a business background to this quest. I think that's important. Both a Fortune 500 background and also a background as an individual business owner. I think the current council and the last couple of councils are sadly lacking in the business perspective and decision making. So it's really easy to pile on all kinds of pie in the sky initiatives and directives. And it's really uh, disconcerting when you look around and knowing that these people have never met a budget, have never managed people, and are by and large in a reactive mode. So I think we need to plan for the future. I'm a man with a plan and a vision for the future. And that's why I'm running for council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Matt, you have 30 seconds if you'd like it. I think I should win because I haven't been on council and because I haven't been in political office and I don't have any of the nonsense that's been going on for years. I don't have any of that. I haven't taken any money from any group. I don't answer to anybody except the, my lovely wife down here. And uh, want to refer back to RTD. Or RTD is a joke and I am glad that um, Joan mentioned that I haven't been a part of that because it's never, ever, ever going to happen. And they have ripped us off, and I'm glad you, that Matt. I haven't been part of a system. Thank you, Matt. We're going to go on from there. Okay. Thank you. I know we can all get ranted on RTD, I think, pretty much. On the... All right, our next question, Ron, you're going to go first on this one. Recently, City Council passed two resolutions on health care and gun violence. Some have said that this is not the role of the City Council, but rather state and federal issues. What is your position on that? I think there are more than enough issues to keep the council occupied. There's transportation issues, there's growth issues, there's affordable housing issues. I will be a council member who will concentrate on the number of books in the library, the traffic jams within the community, and where we go in the future, and what we do to develop an economic model around tourism that expands the base in this community because it's real easy to talk about all the pie in the sky uh, issues and howl at the moon, but if we don't have jobs, if we don't have that third leg of sustainability, which is a viable economic uh, engine out there, both large businesses and small businesses and retails, somebody has to be thoughtful and working in that direction. So no, I will not concentrate on resolutions. I will not appoint ambassadors. I don't think we need to be bolder. Uh, Matthew, you're next. I'm going to have to agree with Ron on this because resolutions um, have caused a lot of acrimony. They caused a lot, caused a lot of dissension in the community. What I'm mostly concerned about is that the time that is spent is spent with things that actually matter. Um, resolutions that, that are going to divide the community just seem to waste a lot of time. And, and I, don't, I just don't want to be a part of it. I, 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 want to, I, I want to do things like Ron says, like focus on making Longmont a better place to live. Um, Longmont seems to be 20 years behind everybody else, and it has been my whole life since, uh, since Ken Pratt used to end at South Main Street. I remember growing up as a kid, and I always wondered why Ken Pratt ended at Main Street. It was because they just took forever to finally extend that thing all the way out to County Line Road or close to it. Um, just. Uh, Economic development is, is obviously, it's, it's incredibly important, but I just, when you have three or four or five hours on a Tuesday night once every week, you need to spend it talking about the Thank important you, Matt. things. We're going to go on to Jeff. Jeff? So I, um, I feel like the resolution, especially the gun one, was kind of a waste of time, a huge waste of time that uh, really took up a lot of the council time that uh, could have been used for more productive endeavors. For one thing, most of the bullet points in that resolution were already enshrined in state law. 
So I don't know what, what the whole point was. My approach would have been to go to the National League of Cities where I sat on the board of directors. You can put the voice of 19,000 cities to work in Washington rather than have some piece of paper go to Washington and go in a file cabinet where nobody's ever going to see it again. That is how you get stuff done in, in DC, is that you lobby, and that's what the National League of Cities does. I really came to appreciate that while I was on the board of directors and the chair of the, Inter of the Information Technology Communications Committee, because that's how we get things done, and that's what I would have done. Thank you, Jeff. And to final on the uh, question number one, Joan. Um, I did vote for both resolutions. City council people are leaders in their community. The resolutions did not go to Washington, they went to our state to tell our state that we supported them in their efforts toward making gun laws that protect people, toward getting health uh, coverage for people who don't have it, continue to work on these things. This city, Longmont, believes those, that those issues need to be worked on, and you have our support behind you to continue to work on them. Thank you. Ron, you have an opportunity for 30 seconds if you'd like it. Every second that we take away from staff time to work on issues like this that are going nowhere are minutes and hours that we can't get back. I think, again, there are more critical things that we need to, to really be addressing, what we need to be about. So I, this is a, a distraction. And then it's very presumptuous, I think, because it indicates that we know better as elected leaders what our city's really thinking. And I think those things should be encouraged, but those are responsibilities of the individual voter. Thank you very much, Rod. Question number two, and uh, Matt, you'll be the first one on this one. Do you support ballot question 3B, which is a sales tax fund to build the aquatic and ice rink center? If so, are there any alternative funding mechanisms that the construction of the facility? As it's presented, no, I don't support it. I don't think there's going to be enough people playing ice hockey. I played ice hockey. It's very, very expensive. Um, there's not a lot of people that are going to be able to do that. However, there is a way to bring the hockey rink or the ice and a pool into the city, especially if we get St. Vrain Valley involved, because not being up front with that in their support uh, is a huge issue. It puts the burden on the, burden on the people of Longmont to basically fund this thing indefinitely. Um, Saturday, I did listen to a little bit of what Mayor Bagley said about it, and uh, he slightly persuaded me with talking about how, um, how it was going to be used. And, uh, but to me also, the biggest question um, is where is it going to be? Because if one more thing gets built at South Hover in 119, I'm going to freak out. Everything is not at that corner. There's nothing out northeast or there's nothing out northwest, and something needs to be out that way. Thank you very much. Jeff, what are your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> council referred this measure to the ballot, and you know what? I think it's up to the voter to decide what, what Longmont wants. I really don't have an opinion on this that would uh, sway me one way or another, but it is democracy at work. And, uh, and when I get on council, I'll support whatever the Longmont voters decide. Thank you very much. Joan? Um, I agree that we did refer it to the ballot, and I will also support whatever the residents want. But I, I did not think we were very transparent on it. It's going to cost a million dollars a year to operate that, with 600000 coming from the tax initiative, and 500000 should be in uh, passes, whether they're yearly, weekly, monthly passes. Um, according to a report that when I was on the Transportation Advisory Board, it is not going to be a money maker when they gave when they presented when the rec department presented it to us. So, as being fiscally responsible to the city, I think the council should have taken a deeper look at this before we referred it. Um, but whatever the, the residents want, that's what I will work to make happen. All right, and our final uh, answers, Ron. You know. Um the mayor was very persuasive on Saturday. He almost convinced me, and then I went home and thought, this is really not a rec center. It's sort of like when Ford went out to build a new luxury car called an Etzel, and an Etzel was just 
a made over Lincoln Continental. I think that's what's happening here. By and large, if we really want a new rec center and we want to oversize it, I think we have to have a community hearing. I think we need to do what we did in Prospect, which is have a big charrette and ask everybody what Alrighty, they want. Thank you very much. We're going to go on to a lightning round. And here we go. This is, this is something that I think we can all relate to. Joan, we're going to start with you. What's the longest you've ever waited for a train in Longmont? <laughs> I didn't time it. I was just reading my email. <laughs> all righty. Matt, how long have you waited for a train? Oh, yeah. It's horrible. Uh, it was about 11 or 12 minutes. It was about a week and a half ago. I said at 5th Avenue uh, when it pulled across 3rd Avenue and it stopped between 3rd and 9th and it just Thank set Thank you there. very much, Matt. <laughs> Ron, how about you? Tell us about your adventures with trains. My adventures at the train, the Longmont Observer was having a cow at the last debate because I had left Northwest, forgot that there was Art Walk, ran into the train. <laughs> and Jeff, train. Uh, just a few minutes. I'm not necessarily affected by it. All righty. All right, question number three. Jeff, you're going to go first on this one. In the past several years, businesses have raised concerns with the chamber that they don't become politically involved at the local level for fear of reputative justice, excessive code enforcement, etc. What's your comment to support free speech of citizens in Longmont, including business owners? Jeff. I guess I didn't get the question. There, people are concerned about not wanting to get involved in um, politics because it may affect their business. Oh, yeah. Okay. Conversely. So, yeah, I think that um, this actually came up when I was first elected. 2013, there was a sign in front of somebody's shop on Main Street, and it created kind of a brouhaha. And I, I don't know that um, there are any really good ways to have really a good conversation about that. A business is uh, not necessarily going to be trying to, to have every single viewpoint represented by their own person, but they also have to serve a public that has got a, a diversity of views. Uh, how they can um, support the political process is, you know, why wouldn't you donate uh, goods or services or, or dollars to help a camp, uh, your preferred candidate win their election. That would be my suggestion. Alrighty, Joan, your thoughts? Um, I don't put businesses on the spot to, uh, to support one candidate over the other. I think it is a very tough spot for them to be in. If you're ideological and you see a specific sign for somebody in a shop window, you may or may not go in there, and that is not really their job. The business's job is to serve the public in whatever Whatever business they're in, be it retail or um, or, or a service, so I, I personally don't have any desire to put them on the spot to do that. All right, Ron. I guess I would disagree. I think businesses currently aren't at the table, and they're not at the table because they're not involved in the process. You have to be strong. You have to have a thick skin. But I think it's the responsibility of the business community as well as all citizens to be involved in the political process. We all have to be heard, and it, it isn't a very pretty process, but all of us need equally to be involved and carry the weight. And if you're not, you're not gonna get heard. All right, Matt, your thoughts? So I've had the same route for UPS for 22 years, uh, 9th Avenue, 3rd Avenue, Main Street out to County Line Road, and I've had probably half a dozen or more, no, it's closer to a dozen at least, businesses offer to put up my signs, and I'm probably going to take them up on that. I think the larger issue is why did we get to a point where people are scared about their business because of their political views? I think that speaks to a larger cultural issue than it does to a long month specific issue. We should be allowed to express our political opinions without fear of being uh, reprimanded or sneered at or snarled at. It's disgusting, and I cannot believe we've gotten to a point in Longmont that you can't say what you think about something without someone uh, getting all upset or bit out of shape with you. It's wrong. It's not the Longmont I grew up in, and I hope it doesn't continue. Jeff, you have uh, a little bit of time if you'd like. Yeah, I think that Matt makes a good point. 
polit the political process is getting kind of, um, can be kind of mean sometimes. And the other side of this is that, you know, it is a choice. There's nothing to stop a business from putting up a sign in their storefront. However, if someone may not choose to come in the door. All righty, we're going to move on to our next question. Joan, you're going to be the first one to answer this one. Mayor Bagley, in a recent televised interview, said that RTD must be smoking crack if they think Longmont <laughs> will support an additional tax to fund fast tracks. Smoking crack aside, do you agree with Mayor Bagley's sentiment that Longmont voters would not support this? Joan? I do agree with that. And they might be smoking marijuana, not crack. <laughs> um, you know, we've been looking at the RTD uh, funding for doing a deep dive into that, and, and they are, uh, they're going to have more, more, uh, I'm saying it wrong, they, they will be able to bond more money in the near future because they're paying off indebtedness. RTD does not need to raise the taxes. They need to have political will and to have the board direct the staff as to what they should do with the money that is being um, led up by the, by the fact that they're paying off their bonds. So yeah, let's don't anybody smoke crack. <laughs> All righty, Ron, your thoughts. I wouldn't uh, support anything that gave uh, RTD an additional dollar from this community. In fact, I've been an advocate that we take some strong legal action against them or use our police department and go down and get our $45 million worth of assets so that we can create our own bus system internally. Uh, so I agree with the mayor. I'm not sure what substance they were abusing, but they were abusing a substance. Thank you, Ron. Matt? So this has been going on for like 15 years, I think. And they, I don't know who the board of directors are. I don't know how they come to the decisions they come to but they, may, they must be laughing at us because it's a gigantic train Ponzi scheme. It needs to stop. We could take, if we just stopped where we're at and not even gathered all of our money back to us, we could just buy our own buses. We could buy 10 or 15 buses that actually ran around the city in a way that was usable for people because I've heard of people that it takes three or four hours to get to a doctor appointment from Northeast Longmont or Northwest Longmont down to the south part of Longmont. That's unconscionable, and I cannot believe that RTD thinks that we're going to sit back and not only continue to pay them more money, but just it, there's no end in sight. It's never going to happen, so we just need to stop it. All right, Jeff, your thoughts on RTD. <laughs> okay, how many of them? <laughs> okay, so I guess that um, what we keep hearing from RTD, we sent them $13 million in 2018. That's the total 1% tax. What are we getting for that? Basically, we subsidize the fare box, so we're not really getting anything for the bus system, and we're definitely not getting any, any uh, commuter rail. So when I hear things about tax increases, or even the term political will, that's a code word for tax increase. So let's just get, real, get with the real deal and say RTD does not have to be a train. The, the uh, ballot measure said fixed guideway. Fixed guideways also include BRT and high occupancy vehicles. So there are other options we need to be exploring, especially since the cost of rail is over $1.5 billion now, and that's in 2018 dollars. So what we need to do is just keep looking for alternatives rather than the train. All right, thank you, Jeff. Joan, you've got a rebuttal if you'd like one. So it is not one5 $4 billion. That was for the full build out of 55 trains a day. The peak service is less than half of that. So um, we are, we are uh, partnering with RTD in the county and CDOT to have BRT on 119. That's supposed to happen in, in about 2022. So um, I've also had somebody look at the hold harmless and the agreement as well as the original ballot language, and we can get out of it, but, All right, but there's the red light. <laughs> Thank you, and that was the red light. Thank you very much. We're going to do a lightning round. Uh, weigh in on your favorite holiday movie, Ron. Oh, God. No, that's not my movie. <laughs> that's your movie. Uh, Lion in Winter. Okay, Jeff. Favorite holiday movie. 
A Christmas Carol. Here we go, John. Uh, Joan, sorry. Christmas Story. Matt? Elf. <laughs> uh, let's see, we've got a couple of uh, questions from the audience. And uh, let's see, let's see if I can read the uh, Scott Cook's handwriting, if that's what we have here. <laughs> All right, let's see, we've got, uh, uh, Matt, this one's for you first. Uh, your opinion, should Longmont be a sanctuary city? Are there financial or safety concerns with this? It's 45 seconds and there's no rebuttal. Matt, you're first. I just found out that we mimic a sanctuary city and I've lived here my whole life. I had no idea. Uh, this was just a few weeks ago. Um, sanctuary city, from what I understand, is just it's going to do nothing but encourage people who commit crimes and are bad for our community to want to come here. I don't support that. I, I, think, you need, I think you need to cooperate with ICE when it's criminal activity or when it's uh, something that's going to harm the community. But to just go up, uh, to, to cooperate with ICE going, up, going, going around and rounding up people is crazy. I deliver to a part of town where it's largely um, Hispanic. And I would hate to think, and I mean, I've been delivering to these people for 20 years, 20 plus years. They're, they're the best people on my route. I love them. And they love me. And, and I can't imagine somebody knocking on the door and right, wanting to haul them off. thank you very much, off. Matt. On that, we're going to move on to Ron. Ron, what are your thoughts on Sanctuary City? Financial or safety concerns as well with this? Uh, I think uh, Chief Butler has really outlined it. For all intents and purposes, we are a sanctuary city. And he has said, in those instances where criminal activity takes place, the police department will do what they're mandated to do and cooperate with ICE. But generally speaking, we're not going to go beyond that and start doing ISIS function or their job, which I think is appropriate. So I'm kind of uh, satisfied with the status quo. Thank you very much. Jeff? <clears throat> well, a sanctuary city uh, is more of a political label. It's not really, an, have, it doesn't really have an effect on how we would manage our community. We want anybody in Longmont to feel safe reporting a crime or go to the hospital. We don't need to put that extra burden on individuals and at the same time, we need to also just make sure we treat people like we want to be treated ourselves. And that's part of what a sanctuary city, the output of an out, a sanctuary city is, and that's what we have as policy and that's what I would support moving forward. All right, and Joan, your thoughts. Um, I was in the meetings that the Latino and LGBTQ held looking at sanctuary city status to determine how we were going to approach the city council to ask for ver verification of safety within the city. Um, but because the word sanctuary had become toxic, and at the time there was a rumor going around that federal funds were going to be withheld from us if we use the term sanctuary, which meant we wouldn't get funding for our schools, et cetera. Um, so we accepted Chief Butler's affirmation and resolution of support and safety and protection. Um, the sanctuary label is really for the people living in the city saying that we will protect you, we will stand up for you, you are part of our community. So I'll always advocate and work toward the protection of our immigrant re immigrants regardless of their nationalities or their lifestyles. Thank you very much, Joan. Our uh, next uh, question from the audience, and this, Ron, you're first. Do you have any affordable housing plans that don't involve growth? Ron? One of the national uh, movements is really to begin to look at some of the antiquated notions we had around zoning. Traditionally, 1FR status really was to protect the homeowner and their property value. As we grow as a community, and the number of pieces of ground that we can really build product on is diminishing, I think we need to be more thoughtful around density and encourage multi-use of different developmental standards, which means that uh, apartments where traditionally we have not allowed apartments should be considered. We need to s 
really work on fourplexes and duplexes. And then we really need to begin to embrace and have a really dis large discussion on the vertical nature of building that's going to have to take place if we're really going to get some affordable footprints. Because everyone knows in the building industry, the cheapest form of building is up and not out. Ranches traditionally are the most expensive pieces of real estate you can have. All right. And Joan, your thoughts? Well, we've already uh, adopted a land development code which addresses uh, most of the things that Ron has said. The one thing that I think that we can do going forward uh, is to look at our land development code and see if we can uh, change it, the zoning and the code so that we can have tiny houses and uh, container homes. If anybody has never seen a container home, Google it, they're pretty incredible. But um, you can use those, on, well developers can build communities out of tiny homes and uh, container homes. This is a way for us to transition from apartments to affordable ho housing and continue to transition up. Some people think that if you just have expensive homes, then people who are in lower homes will want to buy the expensive homes, thus making the inventory affordable go up. But this is a trickle-down theory that really, in the long run, doesn't work. Thank you very much. John. Jeff, your thoughts? Well, one of the first things I think we need to do is make sure we are not losing affordable housing um, that's been that's coming off the, roll, the affordable housing rolls due to aging out of the, of the programs. That was, that's one way to preserve our existing inventory. And as we get into more and more density, then we can also look at you know, the, the fact of we have to figure out a way to provide services and be able to reach all these areas. I know that Denver had a, a tiny home village that was like eight homes are going to be allowed. They're actually talking about this right now. That's something we might want to look into as a, as a city council to see what they're doing. Maybe there's something there. But I still think preserving what we have is probably should be our first priority. And figuring out a way to create more subsidized housing so that we can move into that, that lower income bracket of 30% of AMI. All right, thank you very much. Uh, closing statement time, guys. We're gonna start with Jeff. You've got uh, a minute for your closing statements. All right, um, I want to thank all of you for spending your time with us tonight and the Chamber of Commerce and the Silver Creek uh, Leadership Academy for hosting this event. I am the candidate who will consider all sides of the issues and make decisions to benefit all of our community, not just a few. Special interests and partisan thinking should not be driving decisions at the council level. I am the candidate who will prepare Longmont for the future with innovative thinking, an open mind, and advances in technology in the forefront. I am the candidate who will support entrepreneurship and innovation in our job market, supporting startups, small businesses, and larger employers to create and bring good jobs to Longmont. I am the candidate who has a proven track record of objective, thoughtful, and pragmatic decision making. I don't have an ideological agenda. I am someone who will make a difference, look to the future, and make considered decisions. I am the candidate who is looking to the future. Thank you very much, Jeff. And Matt, your final comments. Yeah, is there some reason I didn't get answers the question previous to that? Oh, did I not give you? you did, did I skip you? You passed oh, me up. Oh, I am so sorry. I just got so excited about tiny houses, I sort of lost my mind because I totally dig tiny houses. I was just houses. wondering. <laughs> can All right. I, can I address yes, that Yes, you first? may do that, and then you can... And then can I finish And then you can. One? Then we'll start timers over. Okay, so he's going to get his affordable housing question, and then we'll start his... Okay. So he gets his 45 seconds for affordable housing because I just, you know, lost my mind That's there okay. for a minute. Sorry. So real quick, back to affordable housing. One of the, the, one of the things I keep pushing for uh, since the day I decided to run for council was how egregious I felt it was that Boulder County owns like 70, 65, 70, 75% of, of, of the land immediately surrounding Longmont. I was shocked when I printed out the uh, Longmont Space Master Plan and then highlighted it. I could not believe that they have built a wall of property around us. I would much prefer that if we're going to have open space, which I think it's good, that we need to um, own it. The city needs to own it. 
And the reason affordable housing is so hard is because at that time, the land inside that wall becomes more valuable. All right, Matt. Matt, we'd love to have, hear your last? closing statements. Okay. You've, got, you've got a minute for that. Okay. So here I go again. Um, you know, I've been all over the world and I've traveled to places that um, things like personal property rights don't exist. Um, mass transit does exist and it works. Uh, it's, it's exactly opposite living in Longmont. Um, there are people in this audience I have delivered to that I have seen your kids grow up, that I've seen you move into different homes. I've been a part of this community for my entire life. Uh, graduated high school from here. I know the streets, I know the layout, I know the people, and I know the culture. And I know that uh, I set myself apart because I don't have a lot of credentials, but no one had credentials until they got them. And I want to be able to have the chance to show that I can do what's right for Longmont because I have a different feel. It feels differently for me because it is my home. I have spent my whole life here, and I want to do what's best for it. Thank you, and I appreciate your vote. Thank you, Matt. And Joan, your closing comments. Thank you. Uh, once again, I want to thank the Chamber and Silver Creek Academy for this opportunity to voice my opinions on topics presented and to ask the residents for their vote for my bid for the at-large city council seat. But it's important to me that we do not look at all of these issues and challenges in a vacuum. Everything we vote on and decide has unintended consequences, both, po both positive and negative. In our reach for a bigger, brighter, stronger Longmont, we do not leave out the most vulnerable of our population, which are the seniors and elderly, the homeless population, and our children. That we do not forget that we are a diverse community of Latinos, Latinas, Vietnamese, Japanese, and so many more. The work plan that City Council adopted this year gives us a path to move forward on all of the challenges presented. Thank you, and vote for Joan. And Ron, your final comments. Again, let me re reiterate, I am a man with a plan and a vision for the future. And that vision involves economic expansion through the use of tourism. I think we have the opportunity to begin to s talk about where we want to go as a community. I think we need seriously to talk about building a convention center with a performing arts center, do some development along the river corridor, and really embrace tourism because it's a nice, clean industry. We are so close to the National Park, it would be a shame if we didn't take advantage of that. At the same time, we need to address transportation and parking downtown. We've been talking about garages for 30 years. Let's build a, those garages. Let's make that an anchor for redevelopment of downtown so that we have retail. We can have some urban living in place. We can begin to create a pedestrian mall. I think these are the things we should be talking about, moving towards the future, having a vision, and I, I embrace really a new economic model. Thank you. Thank you very much. A big round of applause for Ron, Jeff, Matt, and Joan, our at-large candidates. That concludes this segment, and we'll be back in just a couple minutes with Ward 1. Thank you. We are going to have our segment for Ward 1, uh, and we have one candidate for that. It's, uh, please welcome Tim Waters. You know what, Tim, this feels weird. I'm going to come sit over here with you. We're just going to have a little chat. How's that? Because that feels weird when there's, I'm just sitting. Is that good? Fine. Okay, we'll just chat a little. I'm surprised anybody stayed. <laughs> well, they don't know who to vote for for this ward, so they're very concerned. All righty. Uh, Tim lights, you know the deal? You know that you got the drill down here? No, I don't know what the drill is. You don't know the well, drill? I know okay. about the lights. Yeah, follow those. I don't know those. who's going to do the rebuttals, though. That's okay, the... well, maybe I will. Okay. Okay, uh, we're going to start with your opening, uh, opening thoughts, okay? You ready? Yeah, I'm okay. ready. Okay. Uh, 20 months ago, uh, I had the privilege of running for the city council. Uh, never thought I'd get elected, but I did. And it's been one of the great privileges of my, my life, professionally or otherwise, to have a chance to serve on this council. Uh, I've had a chance to do it with, with outstanding people and work with an outstanding staff. And I'd like to think that I've represented the residents of Ward 1 in ways that would make them at least uh, 
uh, value the leadership that I've provided. So I, I, I'm grateful the, for the opportunity to do it again. I realize I don't have an opponent, so Ward 1 residents don't have many options, um, but I'll work hard to represent them well in the next four years. All right, thank you very much. We'll have, ask some questions tonight and, and hear your thoughts. So several performing arts organizations in the city, the chamber, and others uh, led by Visit Longmont are working with researchers on a feasibility study for the Performing Arts Convention Center. Uh, what do you believe the city's role is in bringing such a facility to Longmont? Uh, well, to begin with, the, the city has made an investment in helping to fund, we're not the funder, we're part of the funding for the feasibility study, number one. Number two, I think part of the job of council is to encourage the kind of leadership that Long, the Longmont Performing Arts Initiative is bringing to the effort. But beyond that, um, I've, been, I've worked with the, with the city manager over the last year uh, and with a group, some of whom are in this room, a vision advisory panel to envision what we would like to see from the sugar mill to the, to the fairgrounds, which is consistent with the council's vision for development along major business corridors. And the result of that effort is, in short order, pretty extraordinary. And if people haven't, if they're not aware of what, what that group has done, take a look at Envision Longmont, because the results are posted there. Um, it's remarkable. Part of that is to kind of set the mark for land acquisition and to support those who are interested in assembling land, looking for public private partnerships to, to respond when that feasibility study is and finished. I have to cut you off because you know we have a red light. Yes. Okay. There we go. Uh, lightning round. Star Trek or Star Wars? Uh, Star Wars. Good answer. All right. How do we keep, uh, or is it necessary, Longmont from becoming a bedroom community where residents are commuting outside the city for work? Yeah, I think um, that that is part of the economic development question. And I heard, I heard some of the responses earlier uh, in one of the other panels about what, how, what do we do to attract the kind of primary industry that we'd like to see in Longmont that's high end, uh, that's clean. Uh, and I would say there's a couple things that we need to be mindful of. One is that as we've talked about housing in affordable housing, we better have housing stock for young families that if we're going to recruit businesses, they have a place to, to own and to, to raise their families when they get here, number one. Number two, we have a dearth of, of high-quality child care in Longmont and, and throughout the state of Colorado. If we're serious about business development and recruitment, we need to make certain we fill that gap in this community for families with young children. Number three, if we're going to succeed, we need the best prepared workforce in the country that's working preschool through the, the, uh, a great school district and with front range and post-secondary opportunities here to have the kind of workforce that, that supports business, and we have to have an amenitized community that makes it an interesting place to live. I like that. With the recent proposed increases to water and electric rates, how do you see the impact on businesses and workforce for those who rely on those low rates? Yeah, um, a couple of things. Number one, uh, we, are, we are ticking up both water and electric rates for a couple of reasons, and, I've, and the citizens need to know um, what we are doing now on the water side is really making investments in asset management that have not been made in the past. The fact is there's a fair amount of investment that's going to have to occur to make certain that the reliability of our water system is maintained. If we don't, then we'll be like a lot of cities around the country that are fixing breaks in lines and, and trying to recoup uh, after squandering the investments we've made, number one. Number two, on the electric side, the, the rate increases are ref a reflection of the cost of living. Right? The cost of produ producing energy is going up, and that's going to be reflected in our rates, which are still among the lowest in the state of Colorado. So on the, for businesses, um, uh, if they're looking for a place to, to establish themselves with the most competitive utility rates, Longmont is the place that they'll choose to be. All righty. Let's talk a little bit about that ballot question 3B, that sales tax to fund the Aquatic and Ice Rink Center. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I voted to put it on the ballot. I'm going to vote for it, and I think everybody in this room and everybody in this town needs to do the same thing. And I've heard the arguments on both sides of this. I moderated a conversation this morning between the mayor and the former city council member. So if anybody wants to hear arguments on both sides of this, go to the Longmont Observer. It's a podcast that's posted there. Very good arguments that were made. But from my perspective, we owe it to the current users and a future generation to amenitize. This is, a, this is an asset that will serve this community well for generations to come. Our children deserve it. The adult swimmers in this community deserve it. 
the, those who are involved in ice sports, whether they're hockey players or not, deserve it, and it's affordable. Communities like this can afford this, and we shouldn't pit this against other needs in the community, whether it's housing or you know, any other need. All right, let's talk a little bit about Mayor Bagley's famous statements, his uh, smoking crack and RTD. Oh, I've got other statements he's made. That yeah, I... Well, yeah, I, we're going to talk on this one right now. We'll, we'll, we'll pick on his other ones later. Um, what do you think about that and, and the whole RTD thing? Where, where are you with all of, of that crazy? Well, I, think he was, I think he was spot on in terms of uh, we're not going uh, to support another tax. Uh, I, I am supportive of the peak rail plan that you heard uh, Joan talk about earlier. Uh, I don't think, and I, and I think the timeline, and as she talked about what funding that becomes available to, to, to issue new bonds uh, can accelerate uh, that process. Uh, I, I don't think we, I think we need to com continue to, to press RTD, hold them accountable for delivering, but the reality is the economics um, are, are, are such that, the, that a lot of money got spent that, that might have been spent in the Northwest Corridor. That doesn't mean they're off the hook. That doesn't mean we can't have rail on, in a timely way. Um, and I'm not, I don't know, I'm not an attorney. I, I can't, I wouldn't speculate on the implications of withdrawing uh, and in stepping out of the debt service we voted to, to the debt we voted to serve uh, or service in 2004. I just don't know what the legal options are. So, so talk to me. I'm, I'm, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a, I'm a tiny house fan. So is that an affordable housing option for, for Longmont, or what do you think? Yeah, I think, I, think, I think a variety of inventory needs to be available in our, in our housing market. And tiny homes are part of it. Uh, well, the, the council will vote tomorrow night on a, on a project. I don't know how the vote will go, but part of that development includes 26 tiny homes for veterans, specifically in partnership with the Veterans Community Project. But regardless of what happens with that vote, I do think tiny homes are part of a solution. Uh, you asked a question earlier about can you, uh, how, do you, how do you house people without growing? All the answers I heard was you've got to continue to grow, but you're going to grow differently than, than what we've been doing. And I agree with that, that premise. I don't think you can house folks who are currently unhoused without building places for them to live, whether they're tiny homes, which would be transitional in most cases, to affordable units, either for purchase or rental. Um, and some, some will be aspire to move into, into mid-tier housing, some will not. Last thing I'll say on this is um, I'm, I'm proud of what this council did with our inclusionary... Oh, oh, big Red, hang on to that thought. We're, we're going to... I feel like this has flown by, but, you know, because there's nobody else talking. So, so if... Just keep so, asking. I know, I just You're going to ask me go. some of those questions, aren't you, that were about things that I did that other people were commenting on? You like could. a gun safety resolution? Okay, yeah, yeah, let's ask or, that one. Or... Yeah, you're going to ask me about that? Yeah, it was uh, the, the uh, voting for the sanctuary city. No. no that, Gun safety and... Healthcare. Healthcare. Yeah. That's the resolution. Do I, so do I have... So am got, I on the clock? You've got to... Yeah, right. there you go. The green light's I on. I would say a couple things. Anybody in this room or anybody in this town who thinks that resolution, the resolution on gun safety divided the town, you're living in a different place than I'm living. This town was divided on that issue long before I brought a resolution. What the resolution did was give some folks who haven't had voice a chance to have voice on the issues. Secondly, I would say, for those of you who think this is not a local issue, go and ask the, the cities, the city council members and others in, in places where they've had to deal with the aftermath. Right? They didn't talk about it enough on the front end to avoid what became a ca ca catastrophic for them on the back end. I didn't want to have to get up and face this audience or any audience in Longmont if it, God help us, it never happens here. But if it does, that we would not have taken a stand with clarity on the front end before it does. Same thing's true on health care. You think we're not paying for an absence of health care? We pay for it every day in this city in multiple ways, through city budgets and, and what it costs you to, to treat people without, without health insurance in our facilities. All right, so we're going to let you finish up with your closing statements. It's that time already. I know we, it, it, it just flew by. We're having such a good time up here. Really? Okay. Yeah, I know. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll say what I've said before. I, when I ran two years ago, and I'll take the same position now, that uh, what I said people would get is clarity on where I stand on issues, like or, it, or not, tr transparency on how I get to my positions on issues, accountability for the positions I've taken. I'll stand with the positions I've taken and, 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 and hold myself up to your judgment day after day after day. The last thing you're going to get is leadership. And at times what that means is 
not just you know, testing to, to the winds and seeing what everybody else believes, but being clear on what I believe as a leader in this community. Like it or not, and I don't mean that to be disrespectful or in, in, insensitive, because I'm going to listen well, but there are times it's, it's, it's time on, on a principled basis to let people know where we stand on principled issues. All right. Well, you did wind up getting a, a question from the audience, good, so we're going to go ahead and play with that one as okay. well. Okay. Why do you think you don't have any opposition running against you? <laughs> I don't know. I would have liked the competition, actually. I, I think, honestly, the, the special election in which I was elected was such a recent election, and it was fairly high profile. I mean, there were a lot of letters and, you know, there was a lot of act, activity around it. I just think it's likely that, that it, was, it was recent enough that folks said, eh, we'll just let this see how this plays out. Yeah, I, I don't think it's because I'm doing a great job, although I'd like to think that somebody thinks I'm doing somebody. good enough to serve again. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Thanks for being here tonight, and we appreciate you. All right. We're going to get set up for our mayoral candidates coming up here in just a second. are ready for our uh, mayoral candidates to join us on stage and we are excited for our last segment and thank you very much again for joining us and, and we appreciate your support in uh, the local government. Our next segment is our mayoral candidates Brian Bagley and Skylar Throwbridge. Please welcome them to the stage. All righty, welcome guys. Nice to have you here. All right, I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you a little rundown on the rules, just in case. Uh, you've got your lights in front of you. Pay attention to those. 15 seconds. That uh, the the yellow light means 15 seconds left. Red light means stop talking. Uh, each of you will have a minute and a half for your introductory statement. At the end of the segment, you'll have a minute for your closing remarks. I'll ask the questions. You'll have a minute to respond, and we'll rotate those questions for you. And uh, then we also have opportunities for a little bit of a rebuttal. Uh, hopefully we'll get some uh, questions from the, uh, the folks in the audience, and then we'll also have some fun lightning round questions to ask that. So uh, we'll start with our opening statements. Uh, Brian, we'll begin with you. All right, I guess that's what this is for. Hi, I'm Brian Bagley. For those of you who don't know me, I'm your mayor. I've been on city council since 2011. Um, and I've said this many times. There's several debates, so if you've been to multiple and you've heard these answers before, I'm sorry. But uh, I don't view this as a job interview. I view this as a job review. And so uh, here I am, uh, after two years as mayor, basically sitting before you saying, I'd like the job. I'd like to continue. Um, and the question isn't, what do I promise to do or what will I try to do? I think the real question is, what have you done and what are you doing now? Right? So some of the things that are important to me, 100% renewable energy. It's completely possible by 2030, and it's economically cheaper than fossil fuels. Two, oil and gas. Um, since 2012, I and other council members have been uh, adamant in pushing all heavy industry, specifically fracking outside the borders of Longmont. Next, economic development. Um, we're working on redeveloping Main Street along with the River Corridor. However, along with the River Corridor, I'm a big proponent and advocate of a 150-foot setback, meaning we need to protect our wildlife corridor. We need to protect those special areas that make Longmont special. Uh, next, homelessness and crime. We need to figure out a way to protect our seniors and our children and our families, keep them out of living in their cars, not because it's bad, but they have to sometimes live in their cars, um, but at the same time, eliminate the transient element that oftentimes brings crime. Um, we got to deal, as we've talked about, the RTD and transportation issues, as well as I'm a big proponent of early childhood education. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate your statements. And Skylar. Hi, everybody. My name is Skylar Trowbridge. Uh, several of you I have met before and several of you I have not. Um, but tonight I've heard almost every candidate talk about the future and how we need to focus on building a future for our children and our grandchildren and um, every, every person in between those lines. Well, here's the truth. I am that future. 20 years from now, I'm going to be his age. 22, 22 years. 22 years. So... I understand exactly what the issues are that my generation faces. We're facing massive wage gaps. We're facing some of the highest um, uh, housing costs that we've ever seen in the, 
in the history of America. So I think it's really important that we put someone at the table who understands the issues, who understands the direct backlash of the policies we make today, and who understands exactly what our future is going to look like and understands the fact that I'm gonna deal with those consequences myself. So it's not just me that I'm speaking on behalf of, I'm speaking for me too. Um, and another part of this is there's no one else up here doing this. I'm one of very few people willing to put my name out there, speak for people who are of such low income that they are facing homelessness or that they are um, facing exorbitant student loan costs that, they, again, they can't even pass a credit check to get a lease to sign a house, uh, to sign a house lease. So these are real problems that my generation experiences. Thank you, Skylar. We'll be moving and on I want to fix and we'll them. get back with you in just a bit. All right. Uh, Skylar, you're first on this question. Governor Polis recently signed House Bill 19-1210, the local government minimum wage bill. Would you vote to raise the minimum wage in Longmont? Yes, I, I would definitely uh, advocate for raising the minimum wage in Longmont. Again, like I was just talking about, the wage gap is real. Um, I grew up in northern Indiana, and I earned a minimum wage of $7.25 for two and a half years. After that two and a half years, I was given a 25 cent wage increase. And I don't even know how that's legal. Um, I think there should be mandated raises for people who have put that much work and time into an economy and into a program. Um, if we looked at the amount of income inequality that has increased, then we have to look at how big this gap is and how it's taken place over the course of years. So if inflation was adjusted to minimum wage what it is today, it would be close to 17.52 an hour in this county. Um, and that's why I entered myself in this race partially is because of this bill. Right, I feel very, you very, very much, strongly Tyler. about this. Brian, your thoughts? Uh, first of all, let me be clear. Um, obviously, I'm an advocate and a proponent for a living wage. If it were possible to give everyone everything they wanted, not just food, shelter, a pretty home, a pretty car, um, everything they want. Our entire life, what drives this economy is scarcity. Um, I get up every day, 4.30, uh, to squeeze in a little bit of gym time before I take my kids to school, before I visit with my wife, before I go off to work uh, nine to 10 hours a day as an attorney, and then to go on to spend another three or four hours a day as mayor. Um, it's scarcity. I get up every morning because I don't want to go hungry. Um, obviously, you know, we all want to earn more money, especially those on the lower end of the economic scale. I would not vote for a higher economic wage just for Longmont because economically speaking, if you did it as a state, that would have less of an effect as if you did it just with Longmont. What you're going to do is you're going to have employers move right across County Line Road 1 and build there. Thank you, Brian. All right. Uh, Skylar, you have a rebuttal. You have 30 seconds. Scarcity is what got us here. We are in the middle of scarcity mentality, and that's why your kids are having a hard time moving out of your homes. That's why your kids are having a hard time finding good paying jobs even with a college degree, because jobs that pay even with a college degree, I've been looking around, it's about 16 to less than 20 bucks an hour, and that's commonplace. So scarcity mentality is exactly what got us here and exactly why, again, your kids are having such a hard time moving out of your houses. All right, our next question, and Brian, you'll take this one first. Do you support the use of incentives to encourage businesses to relocate or expand their operations in Longmont? It depends. Um, so often, all the questions I've heard tonight and in the previous debates, uh, my stomach kind of like clenches up because all the responses are based on ideology. Um, I, I could answer yes or no depending on the situation. Every time I have voted for or encouraged or fought for an incentive, it's because someone said, if the city gives, for example, Village at the Peaks, $27.5 million, the city will get $116.5 million. I'm not a big fan of just giving businesses money, um, corporate welfare, so to speak, because, well, they're businesses. And we have this ethereal number of jobs and this ethereal number that they're going to contribute to the, to the economy. You show me hard numbers, and you make an argument that this business is going to hit those numbers, and then you hold them accountable, and you don't give them the money until they actually do what they say they're going to do, then I'm for it. Other than that, no. All right. Skylar, your thoughts? 
can you repeat the question so I make sure yeah, I answer sure. it correctly? Do you support the use of incentives to encourage businesses to relocate or expand their operations in Longmont? Absolutely, and I want to focus on green energy businesses to expand their uh, what they can do in Longmont. So I want to create a almost like a small jobs program that incentivizes solar businesses to create the correct outreach for business uh, for homeowners to decrease their electricity bill. So I wanna get as much solar on people's rooftops as I possibly can, as fast as I can, and we do that by incentivizing our local businesses. All right, uh, let's see, lightning round. Uh, Skylar, you're up on this. Does the city have a reserve fund? If so, what's the amount? Yes, the city has lots of different reserve funds, um, but I don't know how much they are, or which exactly one you're talking about. There's the uh, manager's reserve fund. Um, there's uh, emergency reserve funds, so. All right, Brian. Uh, yes, we have them. I think the first one's six, six million. It's now almost full. Uh, we have another one. I don't remember exactly what it is. You'd have to talk to Jim Golden. All righty, so, uh, Skylar, you have this, this question. Sales tax currently, the combined sales tax in Longmont is 8.515%. Do you feel there's a limit to which voters will not approve above? And if so, what is that amount? I can't say there's an exact limit, but I do think when we run tax ballot measures year after year, um, it gets harder and harder to pass tax ballot measures. And that's why Tabor is set up the way it is. Tabor is intended to tell people um, how much money exactly that they were going to be paying into this tax. So. I don't think that it necessarily comes down to an exact number, but I think people will eventually stop voting to increase their taxes based on how many times they have already done it in previous years. All right, Brian? It's already too high. It's already too high. I think 8.15% is ridiculous. Now, there's nothing we can do about it. We waste 1% on RTD. You know, 40% uh, of, of that 1% goes to a train that we're never gonna see. 60% of that 1% that is going to RTD that continues to cut routes. We essentially subsidize Metro Denver's bus service and light rail. That's just a fact. So we're at least 1% high. There's always in government places we can cut. But um, I do think that there's still room to not just increase taxes. Nobody wants to pay more. However, the question becomes, what are you going to get for it? As we're, um, hopefully you'll ask a question on the pool and ice facility, 3B. That's 18 cents on every $100 we spend in Longmont. Not just our citizens, but people who come in. If you ask me, that's worth it. We don't have competitive pools. We don't have ice. As Dr. Waters pointed out, we owe it to our children. All right, Skylar, 30 seconds. I would agree that 8% uh, is quite high. Um, in Indiana, it's close to like 6.5%, and that's where I'm from. Um, but what I do want to do that's similar to Indiana, and this is a nonpartisan issue, we didn't pay taxes on groceries. Why would we pay taxes on groceries? This is a lifeline that people need. And I don't think that, I think that's something major that we could do to help people of low income is to get them to stop paying taxes on groceries. So there's, um, I mean, yeah, 8% is a little high, but we can cut taxes in places that impact people in the most direct way. All right, thank you very much. Uh, lightning round, Brian, it's almost Halloween. Is Longmont ready for a zombie apocalypse? Well, not thanks to Dr. Waters' gun resolution. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I, I am fully and completely ready. I think my boys actually pray for one. <laughs> Skylar, zombie apocalypse? Um. <laughs> say yes, zombies are <laughs> I'm going to say no, because oh, we need more protection from zombies. More protection from zombies. All righty. Uh, let's see. We've got... Uh, uh, Brian, this one's your question. By the end of your term as mayor, what is one thing you would like to see accomplished, something we can hold you accountable for accomplishing? Um, actually, it's, it's, I mean, honestly, one of the reasons I'm running, it's not a big political push. Um, uh, city council, we decided to reach out to a native uh, indigenous tribe. We reached out to the northern Arapaho, and we basically went and said, hey, do you guys want to be our friends? And they said, sure, we'll give it a shot. And so our local sister cities group, uh, city council, city staff, we reached out. We've been building that relationship for the last year and a half. And we've made good progress. Um, we had our first group of uh, Northern Arapaho youth come down. There were seven of them. 
um, which you have to understand with their boarding school history, with their generational trauma. I mean, they don't let their kids leave the reservation, but they trusted us. And so uh, we're about to a place where, you know, it's no longer, you know, Sister Cities or Brian Bagley's thing. It's really a, a, a two sister entities, um, love, trust, respect. And for those of you who don't know, Thank you, Brian. Stay tuned. Talk to me after. It's a cliffhanger. <laughs> what about you, Skyler? Again, please repeat the question so I make sure I answer it right. Yes. By the end of your term as mayor, what is the one thing you would like to see accomplished, something we can hold you accountable for accomplishing? $15 minimum wage. That's why I'm in this race. I really want to put more cash in people's pockets who need it the most. And it starts with our low-wage earners. Um, I've went and talked to fast food workers. I've talked to grocery store clerks. I've went and talked to uh, unions. Um, everyone's on board with this. Who needs it the most? Brian? Economic example, right? I taught, I taught at the Leeds School of Business for four years, right? So let's suppose that we all have no money, and I give everybody 15 bucks, and there's a uh, water bottle. We're all thirsty, and it costs five. Five before I give you 15, but now we all have 15. How much are you going to pay for it? We're still on equal footing. I mean, we just, we just raised, raised everybody's, you know, money, but scarcity, demand, supply still come into play. Somebody who has more money is going to come in and go, oh, you might pay 15, that's all you got, I'll pay, I'll pay 20. I'll use my five, the same amount that the bottle co water bottle cost before, and we'll all put in 15, and I still get the water bottle. It doesn't make an impact. So giving people cash, which is just paper, does not change the economy. You know, resources, time, creativity, capital, risk, that does it. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Skyler, we're going to ask you this question. Do you support ballot question 3B, that sales tax to fund the building, the Aquatics and Ice Center? If so, are there any other alternative funding mechanisms for construction of that facility? Uh, no, I, I do not support 3B. Um, simply because of the platform that I'm running on. I truly believe we need to focus on the, and again, someone before this said, you know, we, we shouldn't pit one issue against the other, but, you know, we have people that have died on the streets in Longmont due to exposure over the last few years with the homeless problem increasing exponentially. Um, I think it's really important that we start Focusing on a future we know is going to exist instead of a future that's full of luxury. And with climate change in the direction that it's going, it's going to be really, really costly to maintain nine tons of ice in August inside of a building. And I, I think that would be really fiscally difficult for me to uh, balance out all these different factors that uh, nature has more account of than what the actual budget has to account for. Brian? Let me try to persuade people again. So Centennial Pool is our only competitive pool, six lanes. It's going to be gone in three to five years. We will have no competitive facilities whatsoever. If we build at this facility, we will have 20, 25-yard lanes. In addition to that, we'll have an indoor leisure pool, locker rooms, viewing areas, admin offices, multi-use rooms, group exercise studios, fitness centers, including cardio and weight rooms, pool seating for 600 people, ice seating for 750 people, and an nhl size ice rink for ice skating, hockey, etc. We keep, so people refer to a 2015 study. They keep saying, oh my gosh, it's going to be $636,000 a year underwater. No, it won't. Since then, the school district has committed $357,000 as just a user per year in order to cover its lane usage. That leaves $280,000. Guess how much Centennial Pool costs the city right now regarding uh, uh, capital purchase improvements, facilities maintenance, and water? We'll $469,000. It's cheaper. We'll never know how much it Build the facility, Carrie. <laughs> Build it. All righty. Uh, uh, Brian, this one's yours. There's a lot of discussion and perhaps confusion on the Sustainable Evaluation System, SES. How would you explain it, and do you support it? That's great, but could you have 30 minutes to respond? Oh, yes. Hi, I'm just not doing well today. It's That's okay. No, 30 seconds. I don't want that. No, no, seconds. I take it back. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Like, holy cow. <laughs> start the, um, start. 
So if homeless people can sleep in the ice rink at night uh, in the middle of winter, I totally support it. All right, we're going to go on uh, discussion. SES, Sustainability Evaluation System. Brian, how would you explain it and do you support it? Uh, the SES system is basically, well, I mean, there's actually two views on council right now. One is that it should be applied to all city development. And uh, the other one is that it needs to, when you're just talking about variances and whatnot, um, beside the river corridor, or riparian areas, how are we going to determine what we, what, we, what we allow to be developed? And when you take a step back, you basically say, God, that was quick. You basically look at how's it going to affect the planet? How's it going to affect profit? How's it going to impact people? And so if it, in my view, if it, if it impacts any of them in a negative way, the answer should be no. Thank you. Skyler? I'm going to ask you to repeat the question again. Sure. There's a lot of discussion and perhaps confusion on SES, Sustainability Evaluation System. How would you explain it, and do you support it? Um, honestly, I pretty much can't explain it. Um, it's, uh, to my understanding, it's a tool to help bring in more sustainable buildings into the city. Am I, is that kind of? It's, it, so I have an alternative method to it, and it's an international standardization, and it's called the Living Building Challenge. Um, these Living Building Challenges bring these buildings up to an environmental code that is very similar to it, but it's internationally recognized. With international recognition, um, we can get to a place on the Environmental Leadership Program. Thank you, Skylar. Brian, you've got 30 seconds. Go to my website seconds. to find out more. You want to rebuttal? No, just basically, basically this council for the last two years especially has really focused on making sure that we keep our town clean, um, that we build and develop responsibly, and that uh, we make sure that, you know, we're just trying to find a good healthy balance. The SCS tool will be, you know, another tool the city uses to just kind of push forward with that mentality. All right. Skylar, as mayor, uh, what... Uh, what have you or what would you do to create a pro-business image for Longmont and is this even important? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so with the Living Building Challenge, like I was just talking about before, um, that would put our environmental standardization directly on our website, right on the front page. If you look at towns from Germany that do that or towns from Europe that do that, you have businesses flocking to these areas with just a rapid degree. And on top of that, um, with the $15 minimum wage, restaurants flourish. Restaurants do much better because service people who work in the service industry go to those same service places that pay those higher wages. So restaurants will do better. And with international standardization of our environmental code, that will attract a very diverse group of business owners. Brian? Can you repeat the question one more time? I would love to. Thanks. As mayor, what have you or what would you do to create a pro-business image for Longmont, and is that important? Uh, yeah. Um, first of all, one of the things that we did is get rid of all pictures with cows. Uh, we used to have mountains with cows, so uh, we've gotten rid of those. Um, Polly Christensen's frowning at me. Sorry. No cows, Polly. Um, the, uh, but we already do. Uh, we already try to attract businesses. Businesses come to this town because of our lo low electric rates, low water rates, our, our high quality schools, low crime rate, and because there's things to do in this city that are family oriented. That's when, when people are going to come here, businesses are going to relocate. They're looking at those kind of things and traffic and transportation and commute and access to people to work in their businesses and whatnot. But that's essentially what we do. So we're already doing it. And I would continue to do that. Okay. Skyler? Any, any I don't really have a rebuttal. No. All righty. Uh, uh, Skyler, instead of focusing on housing, this is a, a, a question from the audience. What would you do to encourage business diversity and growth? You have 45 seconds on this one, and there is no rebuttal on this one. And I'm going to bring it right back to my environmental plan. Um, so the more environmental friendly, environmentally friendly you are as a city, and the more you promote and incentivize environmental standardization and growth, then that just puts you in a better position for competition. Um, also, it's going to lower your uh, electric rates as well. If we start putting solar on all these businesses, you're not going to pay nearly as much for uh, electric bills. So, and again, treating workers with the utmost respect and giving them livable wages, that's also going to increase businesses that come to the city. Right. Brian? Um, it, 
if you're on council, and specifically, specifically if you're the mayor, I've learned that what you do is you spend a lot of time talking with executives, listening to them, trying to convince them either to stay or to come to your town. And so quite literally, if you're elected, or if I continue in this seat, I mean, if there is going to be a retailer or primary employer that's thinking about Longmont, they want to be sold. So they'll come to town and they'll meet with the city manager and they'll oftentimes meet with the mayor. Um, uh, when we did Village at the Peak, Sam's Club, Avexis, Digital, Clo Digital Globe, with LEDP, you know, we spend one or two days a month going around to different businesses going, are you happy? What can we do? We'll, have re we'll hear everything from traffic lights needed outside their, their, their uh, location to we need an ice rink. Thank you, Brian. All righty, uh, another question from the audience. Uh, Brian, you're first on this one. Do you support the building of the Longmont Center for the Performing Arts and Convention Center? How do you see these projects helping and uh, define Longmont's position as a destination? Absolutely. I mean, we have 100,000 people. We have 100,000 people. And we all, we, most of us, you know, middle tier folks um, can afford nice things. And those who can't afford it, we can do things to make sure they have access to those kinds of things. Um, we don't have a place to have conventions. We don't have a place to actually hear performing arts. Our Longmont Symphony, for example, is currently stuck over there in the Vance Brand Auditorium over at Skyline. Um, there is no reason whatsoever that we can't figure out a way to provide a performing arts center. Um, again, you go to Greeley. I, mean, I remember when I was like in middle school, Dr. Waters was our uh, school district superintendent when they built their performing arts center. Incidentally, it had a pool inside. Thank you very much, Brian. Skyler. Uh, overall, I do support the arts, but I, I would like to hear a lot more community conversation about the specific communities that it would benefit. Um, I know it would benefit our uh, theater program, our um, performing arts program here in Longmont. I know that it could um, really help out art teachers in school and uh, theater teachers in our schools. So I, I'm really, I'm ready to have more of a community conversation about it, but I just don't have much of an opinion on it right now. All right, we're gonna, uh, we're, we're at the end of our evening, and so again, thank you everyone for coming. We're gonna leave you with your, your final thoughts with us. Skylar, you're first. Share with us your, your concluding statements. Well, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask for your vote tonight because I hope that you can see what I can bring to this table as something unique, something different, and a voice that needs to be heard. Um, I know I'm of a different generation than most people in this crowd, but I'm here to help you as well. I want to help get your kids out of your basements. And I understand that that's a real problem. Uh, and I, I want to get those kids affordable houses so that way they have a, a transitioning moment in their life to become the most financially stable and um, successful individuals that they can be. So I, I hope that I've earned your vote tonight. I hope that you can see that this voice is needed in this community and honestly all communities. Brian? Um, I've served on council since 2011, uh, as mayor since November 2017. Um, I serve on this. I served on council and ran for council, and want to want to continue serving as mayor because this is the city that uh, I plan to grow old in. When my children are in my basement looking to leave, I would want them to be here, you know, somewhere close by. Um, unfortunately, and unfortunately, um, we have a lot of challenges. Um, people love Longmont. They love Colorado. It's going to keep getting more expensive. People are going to continue to hurt. It's gentrification is going to occur. Um, and when you're elected to, to public office, it's not about ideology. The, oh, there's no magic, like, book that you get. There's no, like, uh, secret code that lets you all of a sudden understand the mysteries of the universe. You only bring the experience, the talents, and, and basically what you've, what you've gotten so far out of life. And then, then you have to figure it out. Thank you much, Brian. And I want to figure it out. All right, everyone, thank you so much again for tonight. Can we have a round of applause for our mayoral candidates and for all of our candidates? On behalf of the Longmont Chamber, the Times Call, and us here at Silver Creek, we thank you for being here tonight. And please drive home safely and don't forget to vote.